Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 63. It's about World War I then, what was happening a hundred years ago this week, and it's about World War I now, news and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. Today is March 16, 2018, and our guests this week include Dr. Edward Lengel, with a story from the Yankee Division and rats. Mike Schuster, from the Great War Project blog, revisiting the ongoing anti-war movement in America. Commissioner Monique Seafried tells us about upcoming centennial commemoration events in Europe. James Shetler, with a story of one Doughboy's dog tags and their journey back beside him. J.C. Jenkins gets us ready for the premiere of the new animated World War I film, Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero. Terry Scow, sharing the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials project from Ogden, Utah. And Catherine Akey, with the World War I commemoration in social media. World War I Centennial News is a weekly podcast brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. This week, as we were looking at the news and the articles from various publications a hundred years ago, an unexpected theme popped out. A theme that covers two ideas that are said to be the only sure things in life, death and taxes, both of which are all over the news this week a hundred years ago. So with that as a setup, let's jump into our centennial time machine and roll back a hundred years to understand how we see death and taxes a hundred years ago in the war that changed the world. We're back in 1918, and some things never change. We're in mid-March, heading towards April, and it's tax time. Dateline, March 11, 1918. A headline from the official bulletin reads, Voices of 25,000 four-minute men to be heard throughout the land, warning all to make tax returns. And the story opens with, 25,000 four-minute men will start out today on a nationwide campaign to impress upon the American public their patriotic duty to promptly file their income tax returns and to pay their taxes. Now, you remember the four-minute men, right? The four-minute men are a force of volunteers that are deployed by George Creel, America's propaganda chief, to deliver four-minute government-written pitches to the population. The article continues to explain, The four-minute men will appear in theaters, moving picture houses and public gatherings. Special meetings will be held by chambers of commerce, boards of trade, rotary clubs, luncheon clubs, and business organizations. Don't delay is the warning that will be given by the speakers. Taxpayers will be urged to protect themselves and aid the government by being prompt. It will cost the government money and trouble to hunt down the man who dodges the income tax. But the word has gone forth from headquarters that this will be done. Be it known that the slacker will be shown no leniency. Now here it gets interesting. The article goes on to reveal how much people actually pay for taxes in 1918. In the article it states, The man of modest income is made to bear just a share of the common burden. Tables have been produced comparing the tax rate in the United States and Great Britain. Here in the United States, the married man with an income of $2,500 pays $10 in taxes, while in Great Britain, the man with an income of $2,500 pays a tax of $223. However, larger incomes in the United States are subject to a surtax. The normal rate of tax under the War Revenue Act of 1917 is 2% on a net income of a married person earning $2,000. The surtax ranges from an additional 1% on incomes between $5,000 and $7,500 to a surtax of 50% on incomes in excess of $1,000,000. So in 1918, we have a tax code that can be explained in four minutes. 
It supports working people with a small tax burden and expects the wealthy to contribute a substantial share back to the nation that makes it possible for them to gain such wealth. Weird, huh? Okay, so much for taxes. Let's talk about the other sure thing in life, death. This week, a hundred years ago, there's a lot of controversy raging in the pages of the New York Times over the publication of casualty lists. Concerned over German abilities to derive useful military information from casualty lists and under great pressure from the French, Pershing only publishes the names of casualties with no unit or home address information. Dateline, March 11, 1918. A headline in the New York Times reads, War Department Stands By the Ban on Casualty Lists, Shows No Intention of Yielding on Publication of Addresses. Congressmen Object, Expect Floods of Protests from Constituents, But Information is Declared to be Valuable to Foe. The article goes on to explain that the French don't publish any casualty lists. Instead, they simply inform the next of kin directly. Interestingly, George Creel, the head of the Committee on Public Information, also easy to describe as America's propaganda chief, is in on this fight, as the Times describes the committee's stand as, quote, The mere publishing of names and soldiers without home addresses to identify them to neighbors and friends, or to prevent confusion with other men of similar names, is so devoid of news value that the committee will not issue these lists. Unquote. Now, interestingly, the New York Times clearly has it wrong, because George Creel is also the publisher of the government's Daily War Gazette, the official bulletin. And on the same day, May 11, in issue number 254, on page 2, there is an article whose headline reads, List of casualties as reported among the U.S. forces overseas. And it continues to list the casualties by rank, first name, middle initial, and last name but no address. Now, looking further into it, we found something else pretty fascinating. A few days later, on March 16, another article in the New York Times is published. Headline, 1,222 casualties in overseas forces so far, 162 killed in action or dead from wounds. Okay, so 162 killed in action out of 1,722. This got us looking at it. The article goes on to list what the causes of the casualties are. Some of the smallest numbers are things like death from gas, civilians, and even one execution. But when you look at the numbers, you realize that out of the casualties, less than 10% are killed in action. About the same percenters are killed by accident, but a whopping 37%, over a third of the casualties, are the result of disease. So if you're an American soldier in Europe in March of 1918, you're nearly four times more likely to get killed by a bacterium or a virus than you are to get killed by the Kaiser's forces. A pretty strange twist of fate at this stage in the war that changed the world. We've put links to our research in the podcast notes. And that brings us to this week's segment of America Emerges, military stories from World War I with Dr. Edward Lengel. Ed, this week your story is about the 26th Yankee Division. And last week you teased us with the fact that this week's story was going to include special rats. <laughs> I can't wait to hear the story. Well, that's right. The 26th Division is the first National Guard division to reach the front. It's called the Yankee Division. And it's formed of troops from Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. They have a controversial commanding general named Clarence Edwards. And Edwards is from Cleveland, Ohio. He's a West Point graduate from 1883. And he has a very kind of down home command style. He's very relaxed and easygoing with his own officers and subordinates. He looks out for his men's welfare, and it's very particular that they're treated respectfully and properly, but he does not get along with his fellow generals very well. He rubs them the wrong way. Pershing has problems with Edwards and wonders out loud whether anyone could succeed in making anything out of him. So it's rather a fraught departure for the front when the 26th Division 
hits the front in February of 1918. They're assigned to the French Sixth Army. The Yankee Doughboys board boxcars that are famously labeled for carrying 40 men and eight horses. They're called the famous 40 and 8s, and these same boxcars would carry GIs in World War II a generation later. The Yankee Division Doughboys move toward the front on train, or they dismount along the Chemin de Dam sector near Soissons. And the Chemin de Dam, it's a hill, is made up of chalk and limestone hills that are gashed by trenches and they're punctured by dugouts and caves. And in fact, if you visit the battlefield area now, you can still see many of those dugouts and caves. The French poilus, or soldiers, welcome the doughboys, work with them pretty well, take them out to no man's land and show them how things work out there, take them on a few patrols. But one thing they can never be certain they'll be prepared for is the horrors of poison gas. As we heard a few weeks ago, the 1st Division suffered hundreds of casualties from a German mustard gas attack, and the 26th Division may well have suffered the same terrible experience were it not for a strange tribe of rats who inhabit the frontline trenches in this sector. Now, these are interesting rats. Usually, the rats are the plague of soldiers on the front line. They have terrible, nasty, unpleasant habits, and the soldiers kill them whenever they can. But in this sector, the French have treated the rats as pets and fed them and trained them to be docile and friendly. And they're quite useful because whenever the Germans launch a gas attack, the rats are the first line of defense because they send up the alarm by squealing when they detect gas wafting in, which they can usually do better than people can. And so they set off the alarm and the soldiers, in this case the doughboys, are prepared and they're ready to get on their gas masks in time. And so they don't suffer the terrible casualties that they might otherwise have done. But the 26th Division is in for a test and we'll be hearing about that in a couple of weeks because they enter very heavy combat with German forces in April and they endure a major battle at a place called Sietzpre, which I will be talking about in a few weeks. That's a great story. Ed, what are you going to be telling us about next week? So next week I will be talking about the German offensive of March 21st 1918, the huge overwhelming offensive, and one American regiment of engineers, the six engineers, were caught up in that German offensive with British forces, and they were forced right away into a combat role. It's a very dramatic story. Dr. Edward Lengel is an American military historian, author, and our segment host for America Emerges, military stories from World War I. There are links in the podcast notes to Ed's post and his website as an author. Combining the War in the Sky and Women's History Month, we have this first-person account from a YMCA canteen worker who went to Paris to help our boys. This week, 100 years ago, the War in the Sky over Paris is alive with attacks on the city. This is one of the last letters, written by a Miss Winona C. Martin, a YMCA worker who was killed in a German air raid attack on Paris. In this letter, she describes another raid, much like the one in which she was killed. Hospitalized in Paris with bronchitis, she writes, Above the red brick wall, which is all I see of the world's most beautiful city, there rises a patch of sky. And as the lights began to fade on my first night in the hospital, I noticed some stars of marvelous brilliance. Suddenly they began to move about in the weirdest manner, which I thought was due to the fact that I was slightly light-headed. My nurse came to me presently and explained that these were airplanes on guard. She said the Bosch were expected at any moment because it was full moon. The following night, I was watching them again, when suddenly I heard the boom of cannons. There came the call of sirens, which warns Paris that an air raid is on. There followed a scene, as I hope never to witness again. All the lights were extinguished, and the women in the ward across the hall awakened and commenced to call to the saints and the virgin for protection. 
Further down, I heard babies crying. The nurses walked up and down, wringing their hands, yet trying to prevent a panic. For a half an hour, the firing continued, sometimes directly above our heads and sometimes becoming more distant. Meanwhile, the whole battle was visible from my window. The airplanes, mere streaks of light, darted hither and thither, and sometimes there was a blaze like a falling star when one was hit. At the end of that time, the firing ceased. The siren blew the recall, which meant that the Bosch were driven back, and to my immense surprise, the whole hospital instantly calmed down, turned over on its pillows, and went peacefully back to sleep. Sadly, Miss Martin was a civilian casualty this month, but her letters home give us a special glimpse into one woman's experience of the war in the sky and the war in Paris 100 years ago this week. Now on to the Great War Project with Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, this week you turn your focus back to the home front with a report on those who still resist America's participation in the war. Their voice is not a welcome echo in the U.S., is it, Mike? No, it isn't. And so we have to say the headline reads, American anti-war movement still alive. A thousand protesters in prison socialists won't repent on easy days on the battlefront. And this is special to the Great War Project. The anti-war movement in the United States remains as intense as ever. That's the view of historian Adam Hochschild as he surveys the battlefields these days a century ago. More than a thousand conscientious objectors were still behind bars in the United States, Oak Shield reports, and attendance at peace rallies was on the rise. American radicals scoffed at President Woodrow Wilson's high-flown rhetoric about democracy and self-determination, Oak Shield writes, insisting that the real reason the U.S. was fighting for an allied victory was to ensure that massive American war loans to Britain and France would be paid back. Although American war resistors were never as numerous as their British counterparts, more than 500 draftees refused any sort of alternative service and went to prison. Witness the case of the American Socialist Party leader, Eugene Debs. Debs left a sickbed in 1918 to give a series of anti-war speeches for which he too was thrown behind bars. The judge told him he might get a lesser sentence if he repented. Repent, asked Debs, repent for standing like a man. In the spring of 1918, Debs is given a 10-year sentence for violating the recently sharpened Espionage Act, according to historian Michael Kazin. Debs speaks at a picnic for Socialist Party members in Ohio. On that occasion, Debs does not rail against conscription, nor specifically condemn the war Americans were currently fighting. Instead, Kazin notes, he rails against the fact that the working class has never yet had a voice in declaring war but were taught it was their patriotic duty to have themselves slaughtered at command. Kazin concludes that was evidently too much for the Justice Department. Later, Debs would remain in prison even though he eventually ran for president on the socialist ticket. On the battlefield, Oak Shield reports, in early March 1918, General Sir Douglas Haig, the commander of British forces, gets an intelligence report. An offensive on a big scale will take place during the current month. That intelligence proves to be true. These were uneasy days, observes historian Gary Mead, with both British and French commanders just one step away from panic as the long-expected German explosion seemed to be unstoppable. Haig describes the situation for the British as their backs are against the wall, fighting for survival along a battlefront of 150 miles. When the German army launched the first of five powerful offensives on March 21st, a century ago, writes one historian, only 300,000 American troops had arrived in France, and they were still being assigned to quiet sectors where they could continue their training. As for the anti-war activists in the United States, many shift their views and embrace President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, but some dig in their heels, making resistance stronger, writes historian Michael Kazin. Not every prominent radical softened his or her opinion of Wilson. Socialist Eugene Debs remained a steadfast foe of American belligerency. 
And the leader of the Wobblies, Big Bill Haywood, and more than 100 of his IWW comrades remained confined to a Chicago jail for their opposition to American participation in the war. And that's the news from the Great War Project this week, 100 years ago today. Mike Schuster from the Great War Project blog. If you'd like to see videos about World War I, we suggest our friends at the Great War Channel on YouTube. This week's new episodes include Peace in the East, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and German Tactics for the 1918 Spring Offensive. See their videos by searching for the Great War on YouTube or by following the link in the podcast notes. And now it's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. This part of the podcast isn't about the past. It's about now and what's happening to commemorate the centennial of the war that changed the world. This week in Commission News, we're looking across the Atlantic and towards the summer to the many centennial commemoration events that will be taking place all across Europe as the desperate and the decisive battles that brought the war to an end are remembered. Joining us with an overview on commemoration activities across the pond is U.S. World War I Centennial Commissioner Monique Seafried. Monique, welcome back to the show. You know, we haven't had you on the show for a really long time. Theo, it's a pleasure to be on the show. I listen to the podcast very often and I always enjoy them. So I am delighted to be able to present those events which are upcoming. Well, thank you, Monique. So in overview, what are the key commemoration events? There are, in fact, four major commemoration events. The first one is around the first U.S. operations. And those take place at the end of May on May 26 and 27, first at Cantigny, where the first successful American operation took place. And the second one will mark the Enman Offensive at the Enman American Cemetery, where you have 2,289 American soldiers being buried there. 1,289 are from the second division. And in the second division served the Marines who have 337 men buried there. The Marines have been honoring this battle of Belleau Wood with great faithfulness over the years. And they will this year for the centennial year be the center lead of the event with the U.S. 2nd Division. There is a major event happening on May 27th in the evening in the beautiful Chateau Thierry American Memorial. The new interpretation center will be inaugurated. And that is going to be a major event and for visitors to the region it is going to be an extraordinary opportunity to learn more about the Americans in that part of France during World War I. Monique, let me ask you, what is the Interpretation Center? An Interpretation Center is the new word, if you want, to speak about a small museum. And it's called Interpretation Center because contrary to the old tradition of just displaying objects, there you are really learning and using all the modern techniques about what happened at the time. Thank you. The second set of commemoration is around the second battle of the Marne and take place on July 28. And it marks the was an offensive at the was an American cemetery. That day there will be then a wonderful World War I fair, if you want, in the heart of the village of Fer en Tardenois nearby, with reenactor, with also bivouac, and you will be able to eat the type of food the soldier ate then. And I can tell you, American soldiers always preferred the French food 
1918 than the American canned food that they were <laughs> receiving. So we will see <laughs> what we will be served. And at night, there is going to be an incredible sound and light ceremony at the French Memorial to the Second Battle of the Marne. It's called the Phantoms from Landowski, who was a French sculptor. He did the Christ in Rio de Janeiro. He was a very famous uh, French sculptor. Anyhow, there is this wonderful sound and light that night. But in the afternoon, you will have a very special event at the Rainbow Division Memorial with a ceremony followed by a concert. Then the third series of events will surround the centenary of the Battle of Amiens. And this is a multinational commemoration. So we as Americans are part of a wonderful commemoration that will take place in the Cathedral of Amiens, also with French representative. And then come, I would say, the major commemoration of the centennial of World War I for the Americans. It is the Samuel and Meuse-Argonne Offensive. And the Meuse-Argonne was the largest American offensive that ever took place before and since then. We will start on September 21st in the evening at Samuel with a flyover of the American memorial at Monsec. The next day, there will be a commemoration at the Samuel American Cemetery. And that night will start something really quite exceptional. And it will be a luminary at the Meuse-Argonne Cemetery where there will be a reading of all individual soldiers' name. And on the screen, on jumbo screen, you will see general photos. The name reading will continue around the clock for approximately 30 to 35 hours. So those are really the most official event uh, that will take place during that time. Monique, but if an American wants to participate in some of these things, how would they go about it? In order to do your plans, I would absolutely recommend the wonderful guide that Mike Anlon has just published, uh, American Battlefields of the First World War. I will also, and it's not out yet, but mention that ABMC has produced a cemetery guide, and that is going to be something quite wonderful because it will deal with the cemeteries, but also with the sites around the cemetery. And then in the Netherlands, a new guide has just been published, which is the illustrated travel guide of World War I. But the most important part is really, as soon as you can book your hotel because they are being booked very, very quickly. Now, I know that there's one event in particular that's close to your heart. It's taking place at the Croix Rouge Farm in late July. What is it? It is the ceremony at the Rainbow Division Memorial on July the 28th. And it is a very special event for me because I was responsible for erecting this memorial to the Rainbow Division in 2011. It is a wonderful statue by a British member of the Royal Academy, James Butler, of a soldier holding his dead comrade. The sculptor wanted to represent the soldier as an angel of mercy. And it's very powerful. We will have a ceremony with all the colors of the units who made up the 42nd Division in World War I, 26 National Guard units plus the District of Columbia. And that is why this division was called the Rainbow Division. Well, Monique, thank you so much for coming in and telling us about all these events that are going on in Europe to commemorate World War I. Absolutely. And I hope that many, many Americans will be attending 
because I can tell you, as a French-born citizen, I am really moved to see the incredible efforts that all of these French villages and towns are doing to honor the Americans. Dr. Monique Seafried is a commissioner on the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. We've put a number of the links, including some of the guides Dr. Seafried mentioned, into the podcast notes. This week for Remembering Veterans, we're joined by James Shetler, a citizen historian and independent researcher. James is here to tell us about the story of a pair of dog tags and their long journey back to the doughboy that had lost them a century ago. James, welcome. Thank you, Tail. Greetings from sunny Minneapolis. <laughs> Thank you. So, James, to start, can you tell us a little bit about the man these dog tags belong to, Captain Swenson? Sure. Captain Swenson, Alfred Swenson, was born and raised not far from me in St. Paul. I live in Minneapolis. His house is still there. The high school, though the building has been rebuilt, is there too. We both attended the University of Minnesota, although 67 years apart, and many of the buildings where he had classes are still there. And I had classes in the same buildings where he probably was. Uh, he studied engineering, but he didn't graduate because he contracted uh, typhoid fever and had to drop out. In 1916, he enlisted in the Army and served on the Mexican border. In 1918, he went to France as part of the 313th Engineers. He survived the war, and after the war, he was active in repatriating Polish officers back to Poland. He was scheduled to come home on June 12, 1919, but he was hit by a speeding car in Paris the night before, and he died the next day in an American hospital and was buried in the American cemetery in Sorin, a suburb of Paris. So how did the dog tax come into your possession? Well, last fall, I went to France to visit the places my grandfather was when he was in the war. I was staying in a and b in the village of Nantois, and one of the other guests, whose name is Peter Weaver, from the Netherlands, told me Swenson's story, which was heartbreaking, that he died just before he was coming home. But at the same time, all of the stories are heartbreaking. They're all tragedies. Dr. Weaver had gotten the dog tags from someone who found them actually on eBay. He researched Swenson and found the story of his untimely death. And he asked if I could find more information about the captain since we were both from the Twin Cities. So mostly through the Minnesota History Center and also Ancestry.com, I found out a lot about him. And as a thank you for my help, Dr. Weaver sent the dog tags to me this past December. So then you decided that you were going to take him back to Captain Swenson. How did that work? The more I learned about Captain Swenson, the more I realized how much we had in common, both being from the Twin Cities. Many of the buildings that existed in the early 1900s are still here buildings he would have been at, streets he would have walked and probably driven on. We were both children of Swedish immigrants. We both attended the University of Minnesota. He would have been in my neighborhood. I live in an older part of Minneapolis. He would have, I would have been in his neighborhood. There were just so many things, in addition to my grandfather having served in the war at the same time. I also learned in all my research, especially on Ancestry.com, I could not find any record of anybody from his family having visited his grave in Soren. I checked transatlantic crossings, couldn't find anything. His mother died within two years of his death, so she couldn't have made it over. His father lived till the mid-40s, but I find no records of that. So I thought, well, I don't know if anybody ever visited this guy, but I've got his most personal belonging in my hand, and I wanted to repatriate him with it, at least for a moment. I've seen the pictures. So you went over there and put the dog tags over his cross and took some images, right? I did. And it was kind of appropriate. It was a cold, snowy, rainy, miserable day. And it felt like Minnesota, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> and I thought, if anybody in the cemetery knows what this kind of day is like, it's Captain Swenson, because he was from here. And he would have known cold, wintry, wintry snowy, rainy days. And that's the day we, he and I were having that day. Well, it's, it's really touching because you really, really do seem to relate to this man. Uh, what a great project. It's been wonderful and very humbling. You know, it's 65 years apart, but you're a really good friend to this man. I feel like 
I am absolutely sure that I know more about this man than any other living person. He had one sister, and she had children, and that's where the trail goes dry. Uh, and somebody gave those dog tags away. The fact that he found them on eBay, somebody came across them and didn't want them. And it, somebody in the family at some point. So it's like, he's lost. He's just lost. And I didn't want him to be, to be lost anymore. Yeah, it's a great story. Are you working on any other World War One research right now? Uh, yes, I am. I am researching other doughboys who were killed or wounded in the war. And as I mentioned, my grandfather, Jay Shetler, served during the war from 1918 into 1919. Jay was a mess sergeant with the 301st engineers during and after the San Miel offensive, and then after the war in rural Germany. I have letters he wrote to my grandmother during this, his time in the army. And using those letters, I started a blog detailing his time there. I'm also using a lot of other resources documenting where his unit was day by day when that exists and including other events going on in the war and in the world at that time. Anyone interested in following the blog can find it at J in the great war on wordpress.com. We'll make sure it's in the podcast notes. Okay. James Shetler is a citizen historian who pursued a story of service. Now, if you have someone who served in World War I, a doughboy, a volunteer, an individual, your ancestor, or someone who you just connect with, like James did with Captain Swenson, you can help share their story and get it into the permanent National Archival record about World War I. Just go to ww1cc.org slash stories, where you can submit their story of service to be published and archived. That link, as well as the expanded story of Captain Swenson, are in the podcast notes. This week in our Spotlight in the Media, we're joined by JC Jenkins, VP of Partnership and Outreach for Fun Academy Motion Pictures. That's the one who's putting out the new animated film, Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero, which is having a combination world premiere showing and children's benefit in Los Angeles later this month on March 27th. JC, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So, JC, Sergeant Stubby is a great story about the relationship uh, between some American doughboys and a really special dog that they adopted, or maybe better that he adopted. Uh, and it's based on a true story, right? Yes. Stubby was a stray dog who wandered onto the training camp in New Haven, Connecticut, um, onto the training camp of 102nd Infantry Regiment. He was, it was before military dogs, so they taught him how to salute. Uh, he became a little mascot, so whenever you know, the colonel might come over and say, what's this mutt doing here? He would salute. And so he, he really raised the morale of the soldiers. And when his pack went off to war, he snuck onto the ship, and he actually fought in 17 battles, catching a German spy in the trenches and being promoted to sergeant. He was extremely iconic, leading parades around the country when he came back, meeting three presidents, uh, and even um, having a three-column obituary in the New York Times when he died. The media and the press loved him in the day. <laughs> they really did. So the premiere in L.A. is also a fundraiser. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, through our uh, phenomenal partnerships, we are having three premieres. Uh, our world premiere will be on March 27th in Hollywood at Regal LA Live. In a special partnership with Variety, uh, the children's charity of Southern California, uh, we will be raising both funds and awareness for the Boys and Girls Club in LA with a portion of proceeds going to Variety. What's going to be interesting is we're also uh, going to be doing syndicated um, casting, um, simultaneously is casting two tents uh, on March 28th, two special variety tents, um, hospitals and theaters. So we're really excited about that. On April 8th, we're going to uh, bring Stubby to his hometown of New Haven, Connecticut, an advanced screening uh, with a partnership with Bowties and Connecticut State Library and the Connecticut National Guard, which will also, those two nonprofits will be uh, gaining and receiving proceeds and awareness. Uh, we have a lot of stuff planned. You know, the mayor is going to be saying it's, you know, it's going to be announcing April 8th the stubby day and closing off the block. It's going to be right there on the New Haven Green where we begin the movie. Uh, so we're really excited about that uh, advanced screening. And our last advanced screening will be on April 11th in Columbus, Georgia, which will be at the National Infantry Museum. And the proceeds will also benefit them. 
Well, JC, that seems to be part of Fun Academy's culture. You make movies, but you also have a philanthropic bent, creating events to raise awareness for the film and raise money for the causes. Yes, it is in the DNA of the company. It's really important to us. You know, we just did a Sergeant Stubby look-alike contest, and it evolved naturally because Stubby is the quintessential shelter dog. You know, we wanted to support our animal rescue partners by helping bring awareness to their efforts, uh, and that's important to us. Um, as they help us, it, it's not a true partnership unless it's mutually beneficial. So, you know, these animal rescues are in the trenches, if you will, of helping dogs just like Stubby find a pack or a home and uh, helping them market their adoptable dogs we wanted to hold a contest. Um, so the response was amazing, and most of the dogs uh, were adopted that are marketed as a stubby lookalike, which has just been this incredible phenomenon uh, sweeping across America. Uh, also, we were able to give $2,000 to applicants towards adoption fees, um, and also 1500 to the top three winners. Uh, we, were, we were even able to adopt our own lookalike stubs from Dallas, Texas, um, and we got to support, uh, we go and support our partner's events by bringing him in the replica jacket that you might know is uh, preserved along with Sergeant Stubby at the Smithsonian American History Museum. Uh, and, and truly, to answer your question, we really have the privilege of telling the story of this iconic historical figure. We have the privilege, but we also, we have the responsibility uh, to be that force for good like Stubby was. And that is very important to us. Well, you know, aside from that, it's a really fun and good movie. So that's really important. Yeah. Where can the public go see the movie? Because it really is uh, a great ride. Yeah, it's it, it's really just this epic adventure, um, you know, that you're seeing through. It's very innovative because it's all through the eyes of this dog. So Sergeant Stubby is marching into theaters April 13th. Um, Friday the 13th, uh, we are projected to be on 3,000 screens across North America with a PG rating. This is a great one to take your kids to. Yes, definitely. We want to make entertaining, innovative, educational content. You know, why, why have we gotten accustomed to educational content being the JV team? So we're bringing the varsity team <laughs> to educational content, and we want people to learn while they're having fun. Uh, so we, we hope that you'll support us in our Launchpad movie, um, Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero, coming to theaters April 13th. J.C. Jenkins is the VP of Partnerships and Outreach from Fun Academy Motion Pictures. Now you can learn more about the film Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero, by following the links in the podcast notes. And we've also included links to the most recent trailers and to their social media accounts. Another spotlight in the media is for another World War I film, premiering this weekend in both New York and L.A. It's called Journey's End. Journey's End is an intimate and it's a gritty and a really powerful film about men, mortality, and fear. It's a story about a group of British soldiers sent back to the frontline trenches just about exactly a hundred years ago. Now, this podcast audience knows what's going on. There is an imminent, massive German assault rumored to be coming right away. And these seasoned veterans, who are joined by this fresh-faced young 19-year-old kid, well, they know what they're probably in for. What is it you're after? An old friend is out here, Captain Stannon. You don't want to join them. They may have a hell of a time of it. That's just what I'm hoping for, sir. Our company commander, you know him? You'll find him changed, I expect. He's at this company through all sorts of rotten times. Big strain on the man. They have sent us here to die. All these youngsters do not realize how unlucky they are. What does it matter? They all feel like we do. I'm glad it's you and me together. I can't stick it any longer. I mean to come through this. It's the only thing a decent man can do. Now, I just saw a viewing copy of the film, and I got to tell you, this is a really beautifully made, it's wonderfully written, it's well cast, it's powerful, it's poignant. It's a World War I movie you're going to want to make an effort to go see. But the film's only going into limited release in the U.S. We've included a link to the play date schedule in the podcast notes. You can also Google Journey's End to learn more. 
And tune in next week, where we've arranged an interview with the film's director, Saul Dibb. We're going to talk about being in the trenches making the film. You'll like it. Both the trailer and the showing listings are linked below. Moving on to our 100 Cities, 100 Memorial segment about the $200,000 matching grant challenge to rescue and focus on local World War I memorials. This week, we're profiling the World War I Doughboy Monument Project by the Weber County Historical Society and the American Legion Post 9 in Ogden, Utah. With us to tell us about their project is Terry Scow, a member of the National Executive Committee for the American Legion of Utah. Terry, welcome. Thank you. So, Terry, you were one of the very first projects to submit a grant application to the 100 Cities 100 Memorials Program. When did you get started on this? Well, I think we started probably in about September of uh, 16, and uh, I think we submitted it uh, probably in November of 16. Terry, your Doughboy statue was originally installed way up on the side of a building. Was that the Legion Post? It was, yes, on the 24th Street, Nogden. What was the history of the memorial's original inauguration or creation? Well, it was uh, designed by uh, Gilbert Resvald, I believe is uh, the pronunciation, Gilbert Resvald. And um, our Legion post was actually chartered uh, in 1920. And uh, folks from the post uh, are the one that instituted that. I don't have much history beyond that. I'd, I'd be actually kind of curious myself what it cost us to do that initially. And and then down the road, of course, we uh, uh, we donated that to uh, the Ogden City Cemetery. So it could be on permanent display there. And that's why we decided we wanted to help with this restoration as well. It's been a while since I first read your project profile, but isn't there a story about gold radiator paint being used to refurbish the statue back in the 70s or something? <laughs> there is, in fact. Uh, yeah, the uh, statue had fallen in disrepair. Helmet uh, had been removed and those kind of things. And some well-meaning folks had uh, decided to uh, spray gold radiator paint on the statue in order to enhance its appearance. And Obviously, over time, it did look great. Well, it was very shiny. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 not, but not a recommended conservation method, I must add, yes. So, so you pulled together a really strong coalition of organizations in Ogden uh, to do this project. It's pretty impressive. Who all were they? Well, we had, the, uh, of course, the Weber County Historical Society. We had Daughters of the American Revolution. We had the uh, local Kiwanis Club, the Ogden Kiwanis Club. We had the Disabled American Veterans, and of course my uh, Legion post, uh, Baker Merrill Post 9 here in Ogden, Utah. And then uh, also uh, Ogden City uh, came on uh, board as well, and they're the ones that granted us the authorization to move forward on these renovations. What stage are the renovations at now? Well, the uh, statue itself is at a bronze work uh, down in Utah County, and we've ordered some granite panels and uh, they're uh, working on the base and uh, of course our plan is for dedication on November 20 of this year to have the statue uh, put back up and one of the requests that I made uh, to the Historical Society is that the American Legion emblem on there because in fairness uh, our post donated that and we wanted the Legion recognized as the folks uh, who had set this thing in motion initially back in the early 1900s. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. One of the things that struck me about the memorial is that your Doughboy's face is really amazing. I mean, as a, as a sculpture, it's really nice. It is. It's great. It's a, a very attractive statue. And in fact, we actually have a picture uh, hanging in our post of what that statue looked like early on in the cemetery. And there was not a lot around back at that time. So it's kind of impressive to get this thing updated. Well, congratulations on being selected as a World War One Centennial Memorial. And you said you were going to be rededicating it uh, this year? Yes, uh, November 20th. And certainly we want to thank the World War One Commission and the Pritzker Military Museum Foundation uh, to help us with the funding. I think our project's going to cost upwards of $50,000, but it'll be great when it's done. I just think it's great that you guys did this and that we learned about it and we're fortunate enough to be one of the grantees and it was kind of a great community project uh, when we had the historical folks 
contacted me and then you know realizing that it was a legion project to begin with obviously it was natural for us to work to get this thing taken care of did you know it was a legion project when you started you know i i have to admit i don't think i did each memorial day we meet at that location in the cemetery and then our post uh, goes about the cemetery and we put flags on the graves of all those veterans so it had been a point uh, every Memorial Day for us, but I had not uh, made the connection uh, with the early days of when that statue was done. So it was kind of fun for me to learn the history and and then also work to champion to get it updated. Was it the the Hundred Cities Hundred Memorials uh, program that actually got you guys going? You know, the Centennial Commission was a driver because when I uh, I, I spoke to them at the American Legion National Convention and uh, then learned of the funding and then so it all just kind of came together. Weber County had done some other improvements in the cemetery and, and then Tom Moe who's actually one of the World War I commissioners, a friend of mine, actually Tom was a, a POW in Vietnam for about five years, really a, a great fellow. And Terry, thank you for coming by. My honor, thank you. I've, I've greatly enjoyed working with you folks. Terry Scow is a member of the National Executive Committee for the American Legion of Utah. Learn more about the 100 Cities 100 Memorials program at the link in the podcast notes or by going to www.cc.org slash 100 cities. And now for our feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. 100 years ago, penguins stumbled across the grassy fields of America, France, and England, playing a critical and important role in the aerial war effort. Penguins? Yeah, penguins. In your mind's eye, are you still seeing little black and white, flightless, tuxedo-clad birds flapping their stubby little wings on grassy knolls? Well, actually, you've got the stubby wings, the flightless, and the grassy knolls right. Penguin is our speaking World War I word this week. And the penguins of World War I were indeed flightless and stubby-winged. They were trainer planes for the Air Corps. These non-flying trainer aircraft were made for teaching new recruits how to operate an aircraft while still reasonably safe at ground level. Around 300 of the penguin trainers were made during the course of the war, with wings too short and engines too small to lift the craft into actual flight, allowing trainees to experiment with the flight controls, engine operations, and flight procedures while still at ground level. These aircraft were jokingly nicknamed penguins because both the creatures and the planes were something that probably should but didn't fly. Penguins, a useful training tool for a novice pilot, a cute but very smelly animal, and this week speaking World War I word. Check the podcast links to learn more and to see photographs of the penguin planes. And that brings us to the buzz. The centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what did you pick this week? Hi, Teo. Daylight savings time appears in the news both this week in 2018 and this week in 1918. In fact, the most popular article we shared across social media accounts this week had to do with daylight savings time. Most reactions to it were barf emojis and despair, which is pretty much how I felt trying to get up on Monday morning at what felt like 5 a.m. But the New York Times article from 1918 has a different tone. After months of tightly regulated coal and electricity usage, which meant many Americans spent their Mondays in the cold, Daylight Savings promised to help take the edge off coal rationing by giving us an hour more daylight in which to work and an hour less darkness that needed illumination. The change seems welcomed by the people of 1918, but I'm guessing they didn't expect the wartime procedure to come back and stay back for a century. So if you're feeling as grumpy as I am about daylight savings, you can thank the coal shortages of a century ago for the disruption. Moving on to nicer news, we shared another story about a treasure trove found in a trunk this week. Last week, we told the story of a man who's written a book about his father's life and service in the war, which he put together after inheriting his father's footlocker filled with wartime belongings. It seems that trunks and footlockers were the go-to way to store belongings a century ago, as a World War I-era trunk was recently donated to the Texas Military Forces Museum. 
The museum posted a video of curators and archivists opening the trunk, astonished at the good condition and the sheer quantity of objects inside. Dozens of letters, photographs, mess kits, magazines, well-kept uniforms, the possessions of two brothers, one with the 141st Infantry and the other with the 149th and 150th Machine Gun Battalion, 42nd Rainbow Division. You can watch the whole video for a sneak peek at the collection, and if you have a weird old trunk in your attic, you may want to crack it open and see what treasures you have. And that's it this week for The Buzz. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, audience, for listening to this week's episode of World War I Centennial News. We also want to thank our guests. Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author. Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog. Dr. Monique Seafried, World War I Centennial Commissioner. James Shetler, citizen historian and humanist. J.C. Jenkins, VP of Partnership and Outreach at Fun Academy Motion Pictures. Terry Scow from the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project in Ogden, Utah. Catherine Akey, the Commission's Social Media Director and Line Producer for the podcast. We also want to thank Eric Marr, as well as our intern, John Morellis, for their great research assistance. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I. And this podcast is a part of that, and we want to thank you for listening. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago into today's classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast can be found on our website at www.cc.org slash cn. That's Charlie Nancy. On iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Podbean, and now also on Stitcher, Radio On Demand, and as well as on other places you get your podcasts, even on your smart speaker, just say, Play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. Our Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. They'll come over the top To step back to Berlin With a skip and a hop Old Hindenburg will know He has no chance When Alexander takes His ragtime band to France All right. So what do you call a penguin In the trenches during World War I? Lost. So long. <laughs>